So until Sony's next quarterly earnings, if they talk about taking a huge amount of debt on, they're going to price this thing stupid cheap. Because that's really all Sony's got right now, right? Their cameras and PlayStation. Yeah. And some TVs. Mm-hmm. So the only reason they would take on a huge amount of debt or borrow a lot of money is to take a, just a giant loss on the PS5 to get it into homes. Mm. It's going to be curious to see how they price it. Microsoft, on the other hand, I believe is now over a trillion dollar valuation. Yes. I think Microsoft is going to price the Series X lower than the PlayStation. I can see it happening. I think they want to make sure they do not lose this generation. I think whoever announces first has that disadvantage for pricing. That's why we're not seeing pricing yet. I think everybody's waiting for the other one to jump. But I think that's going to be the big determining factor. Aside from first party exclusives, there's no real reason to buy one or the other. You just kind of pick what you can get, right? Right. I mean, mm-hmm. you play you play PlayStation or you play Halo or Gears of War or, uh, you know, the Spider-Man games, last of whatever it might be. But those are five to maybe 10 games over a six-year period, right? So I, I think the pricing is going to be interesting to see how that develops. Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards. I am John Rettinger. And this week, Geared Up, once again, your source for the latest tech news. We have someone who may be the most impressive guest that we've ever had in the history of the show, John. That's that's lofty. And you, and so- you don't even know, you don't even realize the legendary status of this man. I've heard of his wizardry. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Castanelli's with us this week. How are you doing, Matt? Doing excellent. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. For <laughs> now, sure. Matt, let me ask you, would your own parents give you a better introduction than what Andrew just gave you? I, I highly doubt it. And I was <laughs> curious how that was going to play out because <laughs> I heard that the last few episodes. I was like, hmm, I am following Sarah. So like that, I don't know if that's true. But uh, Listen, it's always on the I'll fly. To to it. I don't even know what I'm going to say <laughs> until I say it. Fair. But I just we're back into tech this week. We, yes. we we deviated last week. We deviated a little bit, appropriately we got heavy last so. Week. And then so, but no, we're back with tech. But we do have a little bit of follow up from last week. In fact, before we jump into who Matt is, you remember last week we opened with the story of my saga and my battle with YouTube, right? Yes. So it should be stated that a tweet from Matt was one of the major reasons that they expedited the issue he called them out he asked there we what go the f is going on here and then when they took care of it they actually replied to him and, and apologized to him <laughs> we're sorry sir. Was absurd. <laughs> Were you, so what did, what did they say i mean i had just was like basically in light of everything was like oh okay black creators shouldn't have to like vouch for themselves in these type of situations. That's what I'm seeing all over. So I was like, okay, this is like, Hey, YouTube, this is bull. This needs to be fixed right away. And I did even like send somebody a message that I knew followed me from Google being like, hello, you guys should pay attention to these things because (laughs) it's like for them, it's like a, unfortunately I was like, they will respond as if it's a PR problem, not necessarily even just to be doing the right thing. Yeah. But then I think they replied to that because I was flagging it and they were like, just so you know, it's removed. So they were just sending it back to me, but I was like, did you ever see his actual tweets talking about this? Like, so that was kind of odd, but I'm glad they did the right thing. I because. appreciated you jumping in. As, I mean, a lot the of man, people jumped the man in, to but know. it was your tweet in particular was definitely something that they noticed. So well, I'm glad it worked. Yes. So let's, let's back up a little bit, not all the way to birth, but let's tell people <laughs> who are you? Why, why are you here? Who are what you? What are you? And <laughs> why should people be excited about some of the stuff we're going to be talking about later today? I'm actually a robot that was built by Apple and <laughs> I've been here to infiltrate the YouTube community. No, <laughs> I guess I. it is ironic that now I'm going to say where I grew up and where I was born, um, <laughs> but from I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and then a major thing growing up in my life was my mom was a technology teacher. And so mm-hmm. it always like inspired me to see and learn from my own mom about like how to use technology in cool ways. Yep. I ended up going to Gonzaga University for business and then sort of a marketing degree. And I got really into the social media world pretty much right at the right time, which is when like Twitter was doing all of their fancy new stuff. And then after that, I got a job at VaynerMedia and was like doing stuff for the whole Gary Vee crew and got really into the tech of how we're all operating that and ended up doing Twitter analytics. And then all the while, while I was working there, I was learning about this app called Workflow that I learned from MacStories.net with Federico Vitici. So he's like the... 
he's like the master of I learned everything from him originally until at, at least until the point where I stopped working at Vayner and then wanted to was like, I live in Berkeley workflow is in SF. And I was like, I want to work for you guys because I want to help people learn this. And even going there, learning it, I was like, oh, my God, I know nothing about how this <laughs> actually works on like a deep level and then learned a ton from them. And then about seven months after I started, the company was acquired by Apple. And so that was definitely a huge change. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, here's a small team where I can work and influence the product directly. And like, we can do whatever we want. And then it's like, you are now at a massive corporation and like, yes. t- you have to like get Tim Cook's approval or something. <laughs> so that was definitely a major transition. And I ended up taking the contract role that they offered me to basically take over the workflow support while they, what ended up happening was they transitioned it to Apple care over like the next year. Mm -hmm. But I basically didn't want to leave the community hanging because that was one of the things is for a lot of people, they weren't sure like workflow was pretty much one of the most powerful iPad apps out there. And it connects all of the different apps that you use together. And it basically looked like, is this just going to die or is it going to become something? And so like, I actually left not even, knowing any details which was always kind of fascinating like i never heard the word shortcuts before i like heard it and during the keynote i also registered seriesshortcuts.net so i own that because <laughs> i was like they just didn't jump on it i was like oh yeah who knows maybe they'll come after me for that um <laughs> didn't write a check or something i don't know <laughs> but yeah basically then i was like okay shortcuts is out and it's it's basically workflow plus siri so it's like siri shortcuts i mean we can talk about that whole aspect later but like now it's basically the same thing as what it was before but with a lot more features and basically like apple being like this is a thing so that was a huge boon because just like people are interested in it but since then it's also been sort of a rocky road because it hasn't been like the most stable app in the world like sync stuff was just broken for a long time and being somebody who's like incredibly deep in it that was like completely handicapped me for a while so i would like really struggle to get that stuff done but since then i've been writing for i'm more like writing articles about how shortcut stuff works and then i've been revamping my youtube game to try to get prepared basically for whatever's coming next so that should be exciting nice so let's explain i'm making a a general assumption here that i I feel like (laughs) is true i feel like most people who have an iphone in their pocket have never even ventured into shortcuts. And again, we're going to talk about shortcuts later in the show, but tell us, like, just give us a bat, like what was workflow? What is shortcuts? Why is it so powerful? And then later we're going to go into some specific examples. Sure. And first off, I don't disagree with that statement because I do think one of the major things is that Apple hasn't really talked about it since they launched it. And I, in some ways, I don't think it's fully ready yet. So I'm hoping that that is going to be the case in two weeks with WWDC that it'll be like officially like ready for the average person. Although I still am a person who believes that anybody could learn this. But one of the major things is just that it's very complex. So like to start out, yeah, I mean, overall, there's the feature Apple branded it as Siri shortcuts. So it's I think that's helpful because it is kind of like an assistant. It's like the way that you can build your own paths for your assistant to follow like with one tap icons and then it can follow multiple steps and execute those things for you and a major thing is i mean the term workflow also kind of feeds into that of like you set up your workflow ahead of time and then you can just use siri to trigger it and go through those steps and get it all done and basically like take the the menial part of the work out of it and then you're kind of just left doing the actual creation aspects of it but it works across almost all of Apple's default apps, tons of third-party apps. It can kind of be like Tasker for Android where you change, like depending on your settings, other things can happen, or it can be like full programming stuff that I can like interact with web APIs and pull in information from the internet and do like batch operations on stuff. So it's like a whole scripting program kind of tucked into Siri. And it works with HomeKit types of things like There's cool iPhone NFC stuff that you can do where you tap your phone and then it triggers that whole automation and things like that. So one of the major problems is that it's it's like everything. It's like a toolbox for your iPhone and your iPad. And so when a lot of people start out, you're like, here's 
400 tools, go build something. <laughs> and people are like, okay, like, um, and so in the app, there's actually a gallery. And that was my job at Workflow was to build that gallery. So like, most of it is still pretty much the same, but they did add new categories for anything that's been added since then. But that is like a good way to get started of like the one that Sarah was saying was like a home ETA where it's like when you're I mean, <laughs> I guess we're in quarantine now. So people are generally <laughs> already at home. But it's like when you're on the way home, it can calculate the distance of your work and your home and like say it'll take you 25 minutes and then send a text message being I'll be home at 515 or something like that. Right. But I mean, I have like. I go on to like, there's a whole nerdy deep side too that you can get yes. into, which is which um, we will super be. fun. Sure. Now my favorite, <laughs> totally. my favorite one that I've seen, which kind of is like relevant to today. Have you seen the shortcut where you say or tell Siri or tap that you're getting pulled over by the cops? Yeah. So it's amazing. So you say you're getting pulled <laughs> over. It will dim your screen. It'll start recording video. It'll text and let people know, whoever you tell it to, that you have been pulled over. There was like one or two other things that it did, and I don't even remember, but yeah, all with um, one yeah, statement. It added like GPS too. That yes. was one of the additions. And, I made and a it, it different would, version of that. Yeah, It would text somebody also like, hey, I'm getting pulled over. And that's great. So you have video. You don't have to like spend the time, okay, I'm getting pulled over. Let me text somebody. Let me text somebody else. Let me start recording. Let, like all of this is just done with, you know, in a matter of seconds just by saying one statement and that's kind of the power yeah, of shortcuts exactly so we'll be talking about shortcuts later on in the show we'll be doing a deep dive i first found out about you by watching one of your shortcuts videos it was something like i don't know 20 shortcuts or 20 ways yeah. to use shortcuts from apple, i just started like watching was was like, okay hold one. on <laughs> you, you gotta know, use the <laughs> like from apple employee right. at least once in a, in a use but you're but you're <laughs> right because <laughs> the problem for me was okay here's the shortcuts gallery so pre-made mm -hmm. shortcuts, awesome. And then here's where you can create your own. It's like, wait a minute. I don't even know where to begin how to make my yeah, own. So when I found right your, <laughs> your videos, that's when I was like, okay, some, there's someone out there that gets it. Then I realized, oh, he worked on this product. So this is someone to keep an eye on. So we'll be talking about that later in the show. I want to do another catch-up. It's not really a catch-up, but in similar vein to last week, there's a couple of items that I wanted to follow up on. It's our checklist. A little checklist, yeah. Checklist. First of all, Apple launched a $100 million racial equity and justice initiative today announced by Tim Cook, who said the initiative will lead to changes that touch just about everything that Apple does. They're increasing spending with black owned partners across their supply chain and increasing representation for black owned partners that they deal with. And they're also launching a camp for black developers and entrepreneurs to help elevate the best ideas in the developer family. So not a whole bunch of specifics other than they also plan to work with the Equal Justice Initiative, but very nice to see some of the follow up and change that's starting to happen, at least here in America, due to the uprising you know, that started a little over a week ago. Also, YouTube has committed $100 million of its own money to amplify black creators and develop talent, fund new shows. And they're starting that with a YouTube original this, let's see, today's Thursday, Saturday, called Bear Witness, Take Action. They're going to include activists, creators, and artists to raise funds for the Equal Justice Initiative. So two major players in the tech world, each committing $100 million to this important cause. Yeah, matching what uh, Michael Jordan has pledged. And you know it's a big deal when Michael Jordan gets involved. That, like, <laughs> that is like true. That's, that's how you know there's something when Jordan actually speaks yes. up on, on something. <laughs> like, I didn't realize back in the day until I watched the whole Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. I didn't even realize, like, you know, because I was a kid. I was a teenager. How important it was to a lot of people that he kind of kept quiet on a lot of things that were happening back then. Yeah. And so you're right. To see Jordan come out with his own statements denouncing things is a solid indicator of just how bad things had gotten there. Yeah. I think it's, it's definitely good to see from Apple, especially like one of the things that I was saying last week when Tim Cook posted like the letter about racism yes. was it didn't really say anything about what they were going to do with their own employees. Like I was like, this sounds like it's, you're saying it's happening everywhere else. And I was like, I'm pretty sure 
there's got to be some of that inside of sure. Apple too. So that was good to see. Yes, yes, for sure. Hopefully we see we see more of this going forward. All right, next topic. Let's talk about PlayStation 5. They just, Sony, it's finally revealed. Finally. Finally revealed. The PlayStation 5, it's coming out. They say this holiday, which usually means it's coming out in November, sometime before Black Friday. PlayStation 5, they did the reveal on YouTube and, and live streamed it all over the place. I want to throw it immediately to Mr. John Rettinger, the man who does not care. I don't want to put any words in your mouth. <laughs> usually. You don't really care. You don't really care about. So there's a difference. You're mistaking my lack of game playing for lack of interest. Ah. And those are two. Those are two very different things. Okay. If I had, if I had the time, I would very heavily get back into gaming. Okay. Like I was pre-children. So I will say I watched the Sony event. I've traditionally been an Xbox guy. Yeah. Not really sure why. I think maybe I just like the controller better. I think is probably how that started. And then I just kind of always had an Xbox. Sure. So first, how about the design of the PS5? What the uh, hell? Looks like a router. <laughs> <laughs> they will be offering a digital only version. So without the 4K Blu-ray ability, mm-hmm. we don't know price. Proprietary SSDs with about 855 gigs in the box. Yeah. With how big these games are going to be, I imagine that is about two games <laughs> or perhaps less. So I think there's a couple things that are interesting. First, the gameplay footage looked amazing. Flagship games that you would expect, including a new Spider-Man game, yes. this time starring Miles Morales, looked amazing. I think the graphics look like if you close your eyes and think what looks better than a PS4 graphics, that's exactly what these look like. <laughs> I mean, right? right? They're at this point really good PS4 graphics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Last of Us, but a little bit better. So I wasn't blown away by the graphics. Although they certainly do look amazing. When you think of next gen, you think like, I mean, you shouldn't should be able to tell if it's people or not, but the games do look like a very solid launch lineup. If, if all those launch goals titles do come to fruition, yeah. certainly that is a big question mark. The controller is interesting. I'm very excited to hold it and see it. I think the big question is the price. Yes. Right. Sony, for lack of a better term, pooped the bed with the PS3 launch. <laughs> You're right. right. $600 and they lost that generation yep. to the 360. They corrected it very quickly with the PS4. So I'm wondering what Sony is going to do with the 5. Prevailing thought is we're going to come in around $500. Seems to be the case. And then 450 for the non-optical version, digital only. Mm. I'm curious to see what they do with pricing. Sony does not, even Sony Gaming does not have the deep enough pockets, as far as I know, and based on Sony's market cap, to take huge losses on each console. Now, until, and I've I gotten to the business side of this before this call, I prepared. Oh, I like this. <laughs> so until Sony's next quarterly earnings, if they talk about taking a huge amount of debt on, they're going to price this thing stupid cheap. That's really all Sony's got right now, right? Their cameras and PlayStation. Yeah. And some TVs. <laughs> so the only reason they would take on a huge amount of debt or borrow a lot of money is to take a, just a giant loss on the PS5 to get it into homes. Mm. It's going to be curious to see how they price it. Microsoft, on the other hand, I believe is now over a trillion dollar valuation. Yes. I think Microsoft is going to price the Series X lower than the PlayStation. I can see it happening. I think they want to make sure they do not lose this generation. I think whoever announces first has that disadvantage for pricing. That's why we're not seeing pricing yet. I think everybody's waiting for the other one to jump. But I think that's going to be the big determining factor. Aside from first party exclusives, there's no real reason to buy one or the other. You just kind of pick what you can get, right? Right. I mean, mm-hmm. you play you play PlayStation or you play Halo or Gears of War or, uh, you know, the Spider-Man games, last of whatever it might be. But those are five to maybe 10 games over a six year period. Right. So I, I think the pricing is going to be interesting to see how that develops. What are your thoughts? Matt, are you a gamer? I am an Xbox guy. I'm not like the most intense gamer or something like that, but I definitely play pretty regularly. I definitely just I have a tendency to catch up on older games, though. Like, I just beat Red Dead Redemption. So that was <laughs> kind of my uh, my way to... No, Red Dead Redemption 2, okay. but <laughs> I'm not that far behind. Uh, um, it's like, man, when people, once people start hearing about that game, they're going to start playing it. No, I mean, I like play Warzone and stuff like that, for sure. Yeah, so I was watching it. It's very interesting. Like, a lot of the games did look cool. It is interesting being someone who's also from, like, an Xbox household. I don't know, whatever. But the appeal of games i'm like i've never even heard of this before people are like oh man like this one there's another one and i'm like i don't i don't know what i'm looking at so like it didn't have that same (laughs) effect which i thought was funny i also did just notice that like sony's 
videos were like color graded all of the <laughs> like the hosts and stuff i don't know they just like it was very much a pre-recorded thing which is yeah uh, a little different but i think it is it's going to be fascinating like i'm at the point where i probably want to like at some point have both so it isn't always yeah. totally necessarily a choice like that is a ton of money also and that's not like for everybody but even just lately like some of my friends have gotten playstations and that's when you're like oh god like why'd you do that <laughs> no because now i now I have to like take that into consideration or something yes. like that is it enough to get you if you're gonna buy one to go ps5 next generation and skip the xbox altogether i don't know that's that's a pretty big jump i feel like it I would agree. just be weird I like agree. even the controller aspects and things like that i've never liked hitting triangle <laughs> That didn't make a sense to me as much as B or something yep. like that. Yeah. So it is kind of like, I mean, it's fascinating to see GTA just still trucking along. Also, I was looking in the iPhone six came out when GTA launched. What? So <laughs> we're uh, we're a little far past that now. <laughs> wow. We track times in in iPhone launches. <laughs> yeah, basically, right. you know, I'm ten iPhones old. That's incredible. <laughs> so for me, I'm wondering in previous generations pretty much every previous generation if you wanted to play with your xbox friends you needed an xbox if you wanted to play for your playstation friends, mm-hmm. you needed a playstation now over the past year or so games have started allowing cross-platform play so if you're on a pc you can play with your friends who are on a playstation and someone else on an xbox can join in and all three of you can team up in a warzone game it doesn't matter what platform you're on anymore and i'm curious how far that's going to extend into this generation because if that's the case then it really does just become about the exclusives right like and in a way design (laughs) the console (laughs) design don't even get me started i've saw people on twitter (laughs) saying this might be the first time i buy a console because of how good it looks and i was like this looks terrible (laughs) they both look terrible but like they're both like they're both like super super ugly designs like which ugly design do you the xbox looks like plain like it, at least it doesn't look out of place. It just looks like yeah. it's just a box. It'll right? like recede into the cabinet versus the, this bright white. Cur- it looks like a dolphin <laughs> just like jumping out of your entertainment center. I don't want a dolphin have, jumping out of my entertainment center. I always have like my girlfriend's scoff test where if I show her a photo of it, will her immediate reaction be to laugh at it or be like, oh, that looks cool. Like. This one will not pass that. <laughs> it's right like, now. Did what we need I just a new put router this in the in the <laughs> like next to the TV, just right here? It's like no, so <laughs> that might be the decision already. But <laughs> I don't know. Polarizing. It's polarizing. <laughs> polarizing. Whereas Microsoft went the very safe route. Just here's a black rectangle, rectangular cube, or whatever you call that shape. <laughs> so I'm leaning more towards hey, just give me the plain one. But no, it becomes about the exclusives. And one thing that Microsoft's been doing though that has me like I can see both sides of it is they've been putting a lot of their first party stuff on PC. And then Mm -hmm. if you have game pass, you can play it on PC. So if you Mm -hmm. buy a, if you buy a PlayStation, you can still play the Microsoft exclusives on your PC. So why buy an Xbox? Doesn't PlayStation have the like iPad play pretty nailed down? Like I'm just somebody who's in that realm. It is like I don't know. Do Xbox they? and PC or like maybe PlayStation. I know that they have an app. Okay. I have one pass lets you do it on Xbox as well. But it's like I think it has to be like absolute minimum latency. Otherwise, like, why are yeah. you doing it? What I do wonder, because they've, they've built both of these consoles in a way that rivals more expensive PCs in that the 8K output and the custom SSDs used in both of these are so fast that you can get 8K gameplay out from the box into your 8K TV. Not that many people have these yet. Which is crazy. It's insane. And it seems like Microsoft has the edge there on speed as it pertains to graphics and pumping out just the most eye-popping visuals that we've ever seen in our lives. So... It's going to be interesting. You're right, John. Price is going to be the big one. The big one. Mm-hmm. And that's the factor of this who generation. announces pricing first. Is pricing already just set? Or, I mean, I always wonder this far along. We are in June. Both of these consoles are coming in the next, you know, they're roughly five months away. 
are you in a position this far into launch, like prior to launch, where you can say, oh, they announced 500, so we're going 450 or whatever? I think it could. It'd have to ship, it'd yeah. have to uh, alter expectations. I'm going to call it right now. Call it. That Microsoft is going to price the Series X at four hundred dollars or four fi- under five hundred. Wow! And Sony is going to come in probably at the five hundred dollars. Wow! Price yeah, I can bold. See that. That's bold right there. Like Microsoft has the money. Just to- so <laughs> we did a video that just went live on our channel the week, and it was the rise and fall of Windows Phone. Yes, and I, I mentioned that fantastic video by the way. Let me just say, if you haven't seen it, we'll link it down below. Thank you. Not for self promotion, but I, it enabled us to do a lot of research on Microsoft and how they worked and what they learned from the Windows Phone story. And what they learned was no amount of money can overcome, and not only entering the market late, but a huge deficit. Yeah. And playing to Microsoft's advantage of we got a ton of cash, and our software is unlocked, like our software is solid. If they want to win, and if they're serious about getting into houses, you take that loss. Mm-hmm. You write that off, and you take that loss for the first probably 18 and 24 months. And I think if they do that, and they're not pushing some stupid extra accessory like connect going to yeah. drive the cost of this thing up offering that for $50 less or 75 to hundred dollars less in the competition. That makes it an easy decision for people who really don't care either way. It would be unprecedented only because, and I'm going off the past, the Xbox series X from a mm-hmm. couple of years ago when that launched, that was $500. So they had yes. the, the four ninety nine, and then they dropped the price of the one S to, I believe $300. Mm-hmm. So if they launch the series X at 400 bucks, if you're a gamer, that's almost the no-brainer option right there. I think so. And so I, I played the strategy out. when you, So we figured out what you talked about on this call. I played it out. I'm Microsoft. I announced my price first. Yep. I announced my price first. I get people excited, and I force Sony to react. So Sony's choices are either stay the course, offer it for a higher price, and they saw how that worked out for the PS3. No indication that it would go any differently. Or force Sony to now at the last minute, 11th hour, change their launch strategy change their marketing budget, change their entire company's fiscal projections for the next two years yeah. is significant. So even if Sony reacts and matches the price, you put Sony now with one hand tied behind their back yeah. to compete. That's incredible. That's what I would do. If I had Microsoft's war chest, I would put it to good use. And if I believed in Xbox as part of the future of my business model, mm-hmm. that's what I would direct my staff to do. I love it. Now I'm hyped. <laughs> now I'm hyped for this battle. You got I'm just me saying, I'm just up. saying... I'm sorry, I got a little businessy, but I, I was thinking this through. I, I knew the Sony thing was coming today, and you're like, man, this is Microsoft's got a chance yes. to beat this. Okay, we're gonna keep our eyes on this, obviously. So, just for comparison, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let this one go. Microsoft wrote off seven billion dollars for Nokia. Wrote it off like nothing. Right, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah, wrote it off like no big deal. You think they're gonna sweat losing a hundred dollars per console on the Xbox One? Right, I don't think so. If in exchange for losing that hundred dollars, they can get it into the homes of millions of people. Makes sense. Yeah. Bold move. Okay, let's move on before we take our break. The next topic is Apple has announced, and we knew this, but the virtual keynote for WWDC will take place June twenty second, ten AM Pacific, one PM Eastern, where the future of iOS, watch OS, iPad OS, TV OS, and Mac OS will be shown to the world. And Bloomberg is reporting that we will see the long-awaited major announcement that Apple will be moving away from Intel processors to their own A-series, or maybe they name it something else for the computers, but their own in-house built chips. The last time they did this, just to show the significance, was 15 years ago when they moved away from IBM chips to Intel. So between 2005 and now, here in 2020, there's been no change. And it seems that if Bloomberg is correct and all the rumors are correct, this is the year where we'll see another major shift as it pertains to Apple's desktop and laptop computers. Yeah, this is going to be true. Go ahead. <laughs> true. And I, have, I, I can tease something for next episode of the podcast. Is that a good this time to tease thing. us now? This is, this is what you do. Yes, there's always a good time for a John tease. <laughs> I filmed a video yesterday. And it was inside the mind of an Apple leaker. I don't know what we're going to call this video, but it was a sit-down interview with John Prosser, who's made a name for himself recently leaking Apple products. And he dropped something on that video, exclusive that he's never said on Twitter that he's been trying to vet for months. Mm. So we'll debut it in that video. By the time the next podcast airs, that video will be live. 
and I can talk about the gigantic announcement and prediction that he made for Apple and how they're taking a brand new take on a really cool product line. So just to be clear, (laughs) just to be clear, and I'm not asking you for any more information than this, WWDC's keynote is on June 22nd, 11 days away. Correct. We will have this interview and the information from it prior to WWDC. Listen, if all goes well, this video will be out next week. Okay. All right. Well, now I'm I excited. Know, but <laughs> well, let's talk about what do you think this means for the Mac? What does this mean? I mean, usually when WWDC rolls around, people are excited to see what's next for the iPhone. More recently, the iPad and Apple Watch. And usually the Mac is kind of like, it just it rolls along. Like there's yeah, new features, there's it, more little, parity. At least. <laughs> yeah. but, but what about this is likely going to be the biggest announcement of the show if this comes to fruition? I mean, has Apple's Mac lineup been living a secret triple life? I mean, is that kind of what they've been doing? Remember their, our Macs have been living a double life and yeah. read the Intel stuff. It's interesting. They have to do it right. Look at the sort of the stumbles that Microsoft has had trying to launch, you know, the Surface X mm. and that kind of thing. ARM-based processors are hard to pull off mm. and hard to pull off well. And the reason they're, they're probably going to announce this early with no products coming until 2021 to developers a path to get their apps ready. Yeah. But if they make it easy or suddenly with some little bit of coding magic, the apps just work, it will be an incredible success. If it becomes difficult and developers don't want to do it, it will be hard. But also, it gets closer to unification of Mac OS and iPad OS yeah. and, and iOS, right? I mean, that paves the way to pro apps. It paves the way to Final Cut and all that kind of stuff coming to iPad. So very exciting. But I think a misconception people have is that their MacBook Pros and their Mac Pros will have ARM-based chips in them. And I do not believe that will ever be the case, at least for the foreseeable future. (laughs) I think speculation, obviously, is all speculation. Apple does go ARM. It's for perhaps a revived MacBook, MacBook Air type products and not the Pro line of products. Okay. Now, to be fair, I'm not calling you out. That's all right. Call <laughs> but, me out. No, no, I'm not calling because this is not these are all not right. my words. But in okay. the Bloomberg report, they did specifically say that this change would also apply to the that. pro line and even their most expensive computers. So I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. And you said no. <laughs> I'm saying I mean, I think that would be a huge risk well, yeah, uh, to, for, to do them for, all at once for Apple to do all at once. Yeah, I, I very much agree. With Maybe down the road. But I think at launch, this is not going to be a suddenly every Mac has an ARM chip in it. Yeah. And I think the last one took a while when they transitioned yeah. to Intel. Yeah, it, it took it took quite a while. I mean, I think one of the major things is that it gives them the control over their Mac lines that they haven't had. Like Intel's been too slow. Yeah. And that was I mean, there's obviously other problems with the MacBook Pro lines. So but it's hard to tell. Would they have fixed things sooner if they could have switched to this or things like that is always yeah. up in the air as well. I mean, they do have the best teams working on these types of chips for all of the iPhones mm-hmm. and iPads. So it's kind of like they've been working towards this for a long time. So it does make sense that they would roll it out. But I agree, like just switching the whole line over right away probably isn't going to immediately happen. Yeah. And I, I think for people who don't know ARM or Intel, like to try to simplify it, right? Because this is, this is kind of an in the weeds Please type do. thing. So there are probably terms you're going to hear, right? You're going to hear ARM, you're going to hear x64, x86, Intel. You're like, I, like, I don't know. I just want my computer to work. Right. So to try to explain it, you know, if you're not into this stuff, and there's no reason most people should really care about <laughs> this at all. Their computers, their computers should just work. But if you ever thought why your iPad Pro, why your iPhones are so fast, and why they perform so well. And if you ever happen to see benchmarks of the iPad Pro, why they benchmark so much better than like an Intel mm-hmm. Core i5 or Core i7, sometimes even i9, it, it shouldn't be the case. It sort of defies what you consider logic, right? More expensive the processor, more cores, it should be faster. I'm not going to talk about like risk and that kind of weird stuff here, but it's just the architecture for the processor. And it's a different way that apps have to be written, to sort of take advantage of this different architecture. And I think why people should be excited or afraid is that it gives Apple full vertical integration over pretty much everything, over all the processors. As far as I know, everything kind of except for RAM uh, and probably screen that they're they're buying elsewhere and uh, and SSD, like they have with their iPad and the the iPhone. They can control what those machines can do and how they can do it better. So if developers get on board, you should have much faster, less power-hungry computers. 
Now, who should be scared aside from Intel? Why would someone be scared? Like, first for me, I think we reap the reward on iOS with the fact that Apple makes their own chip and doesn't have to mm-hmm. wait on advancements from another company who may or may not be able to meet their hopes and expectations each year. Yeah. I don't know the top of my head, but does, does the Adobe suite work on ARM-based products? Not that I've seen. Yeah. I don't know that if Photoshop and you know everything will work in Premiere Pro. Uh, if I was Adobe, I would be worried. That's interesting. Like I feel like, again, I have no information on this, but I would assume if I was in charge of Adobe, one of the things that's expected of me as CEO is to see where the puck is going and to also have the Adobe suite living a double life right now, knowing that it can at least run on ARM if necessary. Mm-hmm. We've seen them trying to put Photoshop on the iPad and, yeah. Yeah. you know, so they have to, I mean, people have been talking about Apple doing this for several years. Major companies like that have to have seen the writing on the wall. And if they were just caught by surprise, that's on yeah. them. It could be in the keynote even, like they're that's usually true. their like launch partners. Don't yeah. worry all of your Adobe stuff already works. Like that's a big thing to bring developers over. Cause that's like, that would be a major, a major moment if they did something like that. Yeah. Like the conference sure. is to convince the developers to adopt the stuff. So that would make sense. Yeah. Apple and Intel have a very acrimonious relationship. I remember they were suing each other over their 5g modems and Apple just sort of ended up buying that division <laughs> right. to get out of the lawsuit. So, I mean, there, there's probably some bad blood there anyway. <laughs> But it just, it's a very interesting move forward for Apple. And I think one that certainly makes sense to the consumer and probably makes sense to their bottom line too, right? They can determine when new processors get rolled out. Yeah. They can determine how many they get access to. You know, now they're at the, the mercy of Intel. What their roadmap is, are the processors that will, are appropriate for their computers? How many can they get? When they can get them? Do they have an exclusive deal with another company to get those processors in first? Like, there's a lot of other things they got to work through. They wouldn't have to deal with if they made them themselves. Yeah. This is going to be a very interesting WWDC. I mean, I was already looking forward to the iOS stuff and the watchOS stuff in particular and seeing what the iPad was going to bring to the table. And I wasn't really focused on the Mac at all. And now I feel like that's going to be, that's the big announcement of the day. Yeah. So June 22nd, 11 days away. Very excited to virtually attend. And anyone can virtually attend. Yeah, that's cool. Everybody's invited this year uh, as opposed to years past. Do it. All right. We're going to take our break, and after the break, we're going to dive deep into the world of shortcuts and expose all of the power that you have in your hands that you may not even realize. That is coming up next on Geared Up. Welcome back to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Andrew Edwards, and it is now time for the National Car Rental story of the week. As you know, Geared Up is sponsored by National Car Rental. And if you don't know, I also do a show with National Car Rental on YouTube called Technically Speaking, where I bring you the latest, my picks for the best tech for business travel. Whether you're business traveling or even whether you're going for leisure travel, there's a lot of tech out there that can make your travel more efficient or even more fun. You can check these episodes out at the nationalcar.com control center or go to youtube.com slash national car rent. The latest tech puts you in the driver's seat. National Car Rentals Emerald Club will keep you there. Once again, big thank you to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. All right, time for the National Car Rental story of the week. One of my favorite features, we talked about it a little bit earlier, shortcuts for iOS. We have the legend, and the reason I called you the legend earlier was (laughs) because, now you haven't been publishing as many videos as Uh, you were before. Call me out. (laughs) But... (laughs) There was a time period where anytime you dropped a video, it was like, tell me, I'm ringing the bell because I want to see it because there's so much power that I can't even think to myself how to harness. It's like you said (laughs) earlier, here's all the tools. Now just build something. It's almost like here's all the tools to make a blockbuster movie. Here's all the cameras. Here's the sets. (laughs) Here's everything you need. The microphones. Now just make something. And you're just like, okay, this, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So you took on the role of kind of educating people on how to make this happen. So talk to us about shortcuts 
and how they can make anybody's life better. Sure. I mean, I guess you do have to have an iPhone. So not everybody, <laughs> unfortunately. But wait, would you get an is, iPad, right? You can have an yeah, iPad. Or iPad this. too. Yeah. But that is still like, doesn't Apple have like a billion active devices? So there's yeah. a few people who can yeah. take advantage of it. That's definitely like one of the coolest things that for me, it's, I really see it as a way for regular people to sort of harness the power of their devices that you should be able to do with what's essentially a supercomputer in your pocket. Like we have these amazing phones and I spend all day like on Twitter or something like that and don't end up doing something with it. And for a lot of people, real work does still happen on a Mac or a PC or something like that. So, I mean, there is like, I do kind of split into personal and work because those are like two totally different realms. And the work stuff is like always going to be specific to me because that's how life works and personal stuff is a little bit more universal. Do you guys want to start with either one of those or let's do the universal stuff. Let's talk yeah. about stuff that anybody right now. Good for everyone. Can take out their phone or iPad and just get started with cool things they didn't even realize they could do. Cool. I think one of the nice features that you can have is one of the new automation features where I guess hmm, I see once I go to everyone, I start thinking of specific examples. Like I have a, a simple one is like every time I go on a walk, it can trigger a shortcut that then logs the UV index outside because I want to know like how hot it is and things like that or like the weather because I wanted to have the ability to over time to like understand my sun exposure stuff. So if you do have an Apple Watch, there's tons with the health app. Like log health sample is an action that you can use to log your water or your caffeine intake throughout the day. So that's a big thing that people tend to like not track often yeah. enough. And really like doing that over time has helped me fully like truly understand I can have an espresso shot, but not two cups of coffee or something like that. And it won't like mess up my sleep. Wow. At a certain point, you could even yeah. like literally compare the caffeine intake with your sleep data and like chart it and things like that just through your iPhone. Like there's apps that plug into that. And also I'm trying to stay aware that I do immediately get a little too nerdy. So feel free to, <laughs> to rope me back in <laughs> if I need to. But I mean, like major thing, it hooks in with the music app or if you have things like HomePod, you can like start playing music and then turn down the lights and have it play on the HomePod immediately and stuff like that. So those are pretty cool. So these all require action from the user, right? They won't trigger automatically? If you set up automations, mostly yes. You can kind of have it automatically react to something that you do, but there isn't yeah. like you have a program running on your computer at 4 a.m. every day that executes a thing. That was a okay. major problem with iOS 13 is they released what's called automations and they aren't technically automatic. And so <laughs> you got a lot of like, dudes on reddit being like well actually it's not officially automation but i think that's a major thing that i want to see them improve on this year is making that stuff more seamless because right now i think that some of the best personal automations that you can set up with shortcuts are when you open an app is an interesting one you can have something happen like every time you open youtube it puts the brightness at maximum or something like that that's pretty oh, neat that's cool. So what, and I know we say we want to make this general, but what's the craziest automation you've, like what's the craziest shortcut that you've made? The most wired, like I can't believe that actually Walk works. Walk us through this. I mean, I have very meta stuff because I write about shortcuts. I have to like manage my whole library. Like one major problem with shortcuts is that it doesn't have any sort of folders. So it's just a single file list of all of your shortcuts and yeah. working there and being forced to literally come up with ideas for some, I ended up with like a thousand of them. So it's absurd. And <laughs> it's like overwhelming. Like that's one of the reasons I haven't made as many videos is because managing the shortcuts app itself is like hard. But I have a whole system where when I share a shortcut and it generates an iCloud link, I scrape the data out of iCloud and then I put it into Airtable so that I can keep track of all of my shortcuts. And then I also have a like publicly available database of my shortcuts on my website. People can go check it out. What is your website? Just that. MatthewCastinelli.com. And then there's like uh, my shortcuts library up in the menu bar and stuff like that. I'm going there now. I officially only have 150 in there, but I think there's like 400 now because I've just been like trying to pump them in there. <laughs> but the shortcut <laughs> will scrape out the comments from my shortcuts and also use that information so I can like blog inside of a shortcut 
and then publish that to the what? web immediately and things like that. It's very... <laughs> How is that? <laughs> wow, that's, that's like incredible. A shortcut is technically like just a file once you get it. And then you can look in the file at like the code of it. So I got that from somebody else. I think that's what, what is really cool is that anybody can create a shortcut and share it. Like that alone makes all the difference because it's not just like personal automations. Like there's a hundred thousand people on Reddit who are in the shortcuts community who are like sharing and giving tips about how to work on it. Mm. And you can like make them and share them with your friends and like have it when they add it, it can customize to their needs and things like that. Yeah. Um, when you, when you have people that are geniuses in their field and they talk about what they do, they make it sound so easy. I mean, have you, have you noticed that? Andrew? Yes. Like, people are like, Oh, you just, you just check out the code and you know, you can, you can pull out, you just pull out what you want. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. You're like, what? <laughs> right. I don't even I know. I, simple, I know what those I, yeah, I know what those words mean, but those words together, I'm like, yeah, what the heck? I think yeah, that's that's crazy. What's cool about shortcuts is I am not a programmer, and I never was. I did learn a little bit of SQL, which has helped me to think of things in like a linear fashion. I think that's one thing that gets confusing about shortcuts is you have to like. It's very much like if you've ever tried to program for the first time, and you like. I think a common programming exercise is like, tell somebody how to make a sandwich. And you're like, well, you just get bread. And it's like, okay, well, how do you get the bread <laughs> and stuff like that? Like, it does kind of mess with your brain. But once you get into it, shortcuts is like Lego for programming. So you can just throw in the blocks and see what happens and try again. And eventually you can make yourself like I had a helping hand from the person who designed it. So that did help mm. like majorly. Yeah. And one of the huge parts is like, at a certain point, it does quickly kind of become programming. And so like making really simple videos is like making programming simple for people, which is, again, I start to like have to have all these caveats and things like that, that is not always the most conducive to a seven minute YouTube video. That's I've done streams where I can explain like all of this in an hour and a half, but it takes an hour and a half. So that's always like sure. the, the challenge there. Yeah. But it, I always just found it really empowering because for me, it just made stuff like this possible where it never was before. And it's free for iPhone and everything like that. And it's like getting more and more backed by Apple over time. So that's what's to me. It's like programming for the rest of us. There's like a whole no code movement in Silicon Valley, which to me is still like, I don't even think about code at all. I just want to do stuff and I want to use computers. And this makes it easier for me to like get those things done and it's like, I think the big thing is always like, my phone should be able to do this, but I'm sitting here and it can't. And this can kind yeah. of enable you in a way that previously all of Apple's apps and apps on iOS were totally siloed. Like you didn't even have the yeah. share sheet. And then now you can use the share sheet to run a shortcut and use that data and like go from one app into the next. It's really good for task management, productivity type things or like jumping straight into like deep linking into an app into just the right spot. So instead of going to YouTube, mm -hmm. my library, my watch later thing, I just have the link for the watch later channel and it opens right there. And I can just like, I don't have to think about that as much. Right. But then I'm like, now I have a thousand shortcuts to manage. So <laughs> I've gone as far as you can add them to your home screen too, like their apps. So that's one thing that yeah. I would love to see at WWDC is if you could just run a shortcut from the home screen and interact with it from there, and then you kind of are like doing everything without even opening the apps at all, but you're still right. using all of their power, mm. which is cool. Okay. Let me ask you this. Sure. What is the first non-work related shortcut that you run in the morning? The first non-work related Ooh. shortcut. It runs for me when my Tell alarm goes off. I actually made this for Renee's channel. But Renee is amazing, by the way. We talked about it. One of the greatest human beings. <laughs> yeah, it's like I write for iMore and that was he like he has bridged the world of Apple like podcast people and YouTube so much. It's been awesome. But for his channel, it was one that's I have a series of routine checklists where like I had starting to work by myself from home. I may have gotten worse at some of my daily routines and things like that. Just like you don't have to shower immediately before work or things like that. So just in general, like stuff can fall apart. And I started to realize that following a checklist really helped me, especially when I don't want to do something on the checklist, I continue the checklist instead of stopping. Like that was one thing that I noticed is like having these in my task manager 
helps me move forward even if I'm going to skip something for the day. So this one in the morning, it automatically adds that checklist into the app things. And so then that shows up right on my watch. So that's pretty cool. Like the alarm is a good automation trigger for sure. So your alarm goes off and it automatically triggers an automation. Yeah. And then that adds the checklist into my task manager. And personally, like I don't want to have in my task manager every day or like the day before, like, oh, tomorrow you have to do your normal routines. It just kind of goes in in real time when it needs to happen. But yeah, that's okay. a cool one. Where should people go if they're interested in learning more? Obviously your channel. So let people know your website and channel, but where else would you recommend? What resources should people look at if they want to kind of start getting into shortcuts themselves? Sure. So my website is MatthewCastanelli.com and the menu bar up there is where most of the stuff is. YouTube.com slash Will you, s- Matthew- will you spell your last sure. name? For um, people C-A-S-S-I-N-E-L-L-I. Very Italian. Cassinelli. <laughs> um, but then YouTube.com slash Matthew Cassinelli. And hopefully if you search for Siri shortcuts, my stuff will come up also. <laughs> I do believe if you search for iPad gestures, one of my videos comes up, which was like, that's like the best thing that's happened to me on YouTube so far, nice. by far. But then MacStories.net has tons of shortcut stuff. Like Federico is doing stuff for like the mega power users where he has like yeah. a 900 step shortcut that interacts with every single possible way you can with Apple music. It's absolutely wild. Incredible. Like he's building and whole programs in shortcuts. The Reddit community, you would recommend yeah. that one as well. Yeah. R slash shortcuts. And then actually... Nice. I don't remember the exact link, but Apple has a shortcuts documentation and that was also similar to what I worked on. And that just helps you with the very like this step connects to here and stuff like that. But I'm kind of working on my own type of unofficial documentation now because I want to like be even more in depth and like give the stuff that like my angles. So that will be coming from my website sometime soon. Nice. Matthew Casanelli, thank you so much. For joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This week. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will say I will build you guys both shortcuts because shortcuts for YouTubers is a huge realm. Yes. Like there's definitely I have one that opens into the add card page for your latest video. So like if you forgot to add in the end card and you're on your phone, you can like quickly add that in or something like wow. that. Little details there. So I'd be happy to help. Yes, please. I'm ready for it. Check him out, Matthew Castanelli.com, YouTube.com slash Matthew Casanelli. I guess I did forget. I have a podcast called Smart Tech Today on a Twit Network with my co-host, Micah Sargent. And so we do talk about latest smart home gear. Like we've been covering tons of new HomeKit cameras. This has actually been a great year for HomeKit, even though I feel like nobody ever notices that kind of stuff. And so that shows a lot. I'm of actually look in the, looking for HomeKit cameras. There you go. I am going to check it out. <laughs> Sounds good. Next week, we have the results of John's teaser. <laughs> What was yes. revealed in his upcoming video? Sounds important. How about this? I revealed it during the break to Matthew and Andrew. Would you say it's worthy of that? Tease? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if you're not at youtube.com slash John Rettinger, head there now. Hit the subscribe button. You do not want to miss this one. Please. It'll be coming. It'll be interesting. Or just search John Rettinger on YouTube. You can get there. But we'll talk about it next week. I think it's probably going to take up a good at least half of the podcast. Mm. I'm excited to hear. And I'm just going to say perspective from what Andrew's going to have to say on this. Mm. There you go. I look forward to listening. (laughs) And that is it for this edition of Geared Up. Thank you so much for listening. Of course, you can catch John and I on YouTube. I'm at YouTube.com slash Gear Live. And John is at YouTube.com slash John for Lakers. Feel free to head over and subscribe to our channels to stay up to date on all the latest tech. Speaking of subscribing, you can subscribe to Geared Up in your favorite podcast app if you haven't done so already. Just search Geared Up, that's two words, not one, in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Overcast, or really wherever you choose to listen. If you like what we do, please consider leaving us a rating and review. It really helps other people find the show. Geared Up is a Gear Live podcast, and you can see more from us at GearLive.com. Thank you so much for listening. For John Rettinger, I'm Andrew Edwards, and we'll catch you in the next episode.